So we are starting a new series today. We finished our study of the Sermon on the Mount last week. And uh, so we're starting today the series titled The Kingdom of Heaven. And we're going to still be in the Gospel of Matthew. We spent the summer in the Gospel of Matthew. Like I said, as we looked at the Sermon on the Mount and finished that blessed series last week, we're spending the rest of the summer, at least to the traditional end of the summer, which is Labor Day weekend. We're going to stay uh, in the Gospel of Matthew, or moving into the next kind of phase of his Gospel, which is where he goes into a lot of parables. And these parables are centered in Matthew. They're, the parables are centered on the kingdom of heaven. And that is kind of the topic, and Jesus teaches through these parables lots of different deep spiritual truths, and so we're going to spend some time studying those uh, for the rest of the summer. And then after Labor Day, we will be uh, moving into a new series, and the title of that series is when Jesus went to church, and we're going to be studying the churches in the beginning part of Revelation. Okay? And there Jesus shows that. He talks about what was good about those churches, what was bad about them. And so we're going to look at that and kind of see what that, how that applies to us today. So for those that like to kind of read ahead and, and prepare to study, uh, you can read these parables in Matthew, and then we'll be moving to the book of Revelation after that, just the beginning part of that and those churches. But this morning, as we start this series, this kingdom of heaven, we're going to start kind of with this foundation of parables. And, and you know, with kind of the first major parable um, of the parable of the farmer scattering seed, and that's the one we're going to look at today specifically. But in the midst of this one, there's, again, the, his disciples come to Jesus and they ask him, like, Jesus, why do you teach in parables? Right? Why, do you, why don't you just tell us what you want us to know? Right? And, and, and Jesus gives them this answer. And so, um, he answers them in Matthew 13, verses 11 and 12, where Jesus replied, he says, you are permitted to understand the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but others are not. To those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given, and they will have an abundance of knowledge. But for those who are not listening, even what little understanding they have will be taken away from them. And then verse 16 says, but blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. Again, I bring this up because we kind of have this, probably the same natural question that they had then, right? Like, why would you teach in parables? In fact, Jesus taught in parables a lot, right? And, and a parable is just, is a simple story, right, that teaches a much deeper lesson. And, and most parables, again, come, they have uh, a deeper meaning, right? The characters, the items and things in the story represent something else. Hey, now, again, one of the reasons Jesus taught in parables was just because we remember the stories easier than we remember the actual lessons. So if we remember the story, then we naturally remember the lessons, right? But also, I think one of the reasons, just as Jesus says here, is that some, some will hear it and get it, and others will not. Hey, and, and even this uh, concept about parable, teaching in parables just is very similar to the gospel message. It's available to everybody. Everybody can hear it. Right? And, and God has done his part, right? He's teaching us these truths. And yet, just like the gospel, right? God has already done his part. He already sent Jesus. He, he lived us in this life. He died on a cross. He rose again. He's conquered death. He's provided a way of salvation. But yet, we have a role in our own salvation. It's available for all. It is absolutely free. We don't have to earn it. God has already done his part. But yet, we have to believe in our heart and confess with our mouth, is what scripture tells us. Right? We have to accept that gift. Right? And we have to put in that effort, right, enough to where we will commit to following Jesus. And the same is true when it comes to these spiritual teachings, right, is that everybody can hear it. And like you said, but yet, part of why I teach a parable is so that you put in the effort to figure it out, right, and to remember it, and, and, and to, to get it deep into who you are, and to, to understand this, this complex concept, this, these, these spiritual truths, right, through a simple story. But if people don't want to know about God or don't want to study it or figure it out, to them, it's just a meaningless story. Right? And that Jesus is telling his disciples and saying, hey, this whole salvation faith thing, like this is very important and yet it's important enough that you need to commit to it and put in the effort. And if you will do that, Right? You will see, your eyes will be opened, your ears will hear what you need to hear, and you will learn and you will grow if you put in that effort. But if you don't, it's just a simple story. Right? And it won't mean anything. Right? And this is, a, 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 again, a spiritual concept that we need to know in our own faith journey. 
right? The, the, the gospel is absolutely for everyone, absolutely free. You don't have to earn it. Just receive it from God, and that is your salvation, right? And yet, you must receive it, right? You must accept Jesus as your Savior. You must join the journey of faith, right? It takes that effort on your part, right? And as we move forward to this, and as we read all of these parables, again, we will learn these truths that will help us move forward in our faith as we put in that effort. But if we do, notice that we will be blessed, and we just finished the series on blessed, right? And we want to be blessed, right? And you will be blessed because your eyes will be open and you can see in your ears so you can hear the things of God, and you will learn and you will grow in your faith. So today we are looking at the parable of the farmer scattering seed. It's found in Matthew chapter 13. So if you have your Bible with you, I invite you to open with me to Matthew chapter 13. If you're with us in person, there are Bibles provided for you in the seats that you're welcome to use. And you'll notice the page numbers are included on your outline of where you can find it in those Bibles. If you're with us online, hopefully you have your Bible with you. If you don't, that's fine. You can just listen as I read it. But we're going to pick up here Matthew 13, starting at verse 1, as we set the stage for this first parable. It says, Later that same day, Jesus left the house and sat beside the lake. A large crowd soon gathered around him, so he got into a boat. And then he sat there and taught as the people stood on the shore. And he told many stories in the form of parables, such as this one. Listen, a farmer went out to plant some seeds. As he scattered them across the field, some seeds fell on a footpath, and the birds came and ate them. Other seeds fell on shallow soil with underlying rock. The seeds sprouted quickly because the soil was shallow. But the plants soon wilted under the hot sun, and since they didn't have deep roots, they died. Other seeds fell among thorns that grew up and choked out the tender plants. Still other seeds fell on fertile soil, and they produced a crop that was 30, 60, even 100 times as much as had been planted. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. Again, this is the parable, the story, as Jesus tells it. As we see again through verse 9 is where he gives us the parable, and he tells us the story. He uses a story that, that those in the audience would have been familiar with, right? He uses this example of a farmer planting his fields. Now, in their culture, right, farming was the staple of their society, right? Pretty much everybody was a farmer. Now, I know we have farmers in our community, right? And, this, and I'll tell you, as, as I know, I don't know a lot about farming, okay? But I do know that farming is hard work, okay? And that I don't know anything about it, right? I'm not a farmer, okay? And so I respect farmers, right? That there's a lot to know about farming. And I'm also thankful for farmers, right? Because I like to eat. And so this is a good thing, right? So, but we see here, in this parable is given, but then, then again, it, right in the middle of this is, again, where the disciples come to him and ask him, we're like, Jesus, why do you speak in parables? We don't get it. Like, help us understand. And so what's unique about this parable is that Jesus uh, teaches them and us later in the chapter on how to interpret this parable. So he actually tells us the meaning of this parable, and that is in verses 18 through 23. So we're going to pick up here, uh, Matthew 13, verse 18, as we read the explanation of the parable. So verse 18, he says, Now listen to the explanation of the parable about the farmer planting seeds. The seeds that fell on the footpath represent those who hear the message about the kingdom and don't understand it. Then the evil one comes and snatches away the seed that was planted in their hearts. The seed on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message and immediately receive it with joy. But since they don't have deep roots, they don't last long. They fall away as soon as they have problems or are persecuted for believing God's word. The seed that fell among the thorns represents those who hear God's word, but all too quickly the message is crowded out by the worries of this life and the lure of wealth, so no fruit is produced. The seed that fell on on good soil represents those who truly hear and understand God's word and produce a harvest of 30 60 or even 100 times as much as had been planted. So as we read the explanation of this story, we, we understand, right, that the farmer is God. That the, the seeds is, is the truth of God's word. Right? The gospel message, the teachings of the scriptures, right, that is what is being thrown out to everyone. Right? And then we see, though, is that as Jesus explains, there are, is four different kinds of soil. And that's the variable in the story, right? There's four different kinds of soil. And, and, and to truly understand what Jesus explains here is we need to, again, look closer at the different kinds of soil. Okay, the first 
kind of soil that is described in the parable is the hard path. Now, this is ground that has been trampled on, that has been walked over, it has been you know, hardened, and, and, and it is the well-worn path, right? It is hard ground. And when things about hard ground, right, is that it doesn't receive the seed, right? It just sits on top. And so we see that that's the result, right, of, of the seed that lands on the, the hard path, is that it's snatched away, and it, it never germinates, it never grows, it, and nothing happens to it other than it is snatched away. And so the result of the, the seed on the hard path is there's no understanding there's no acceptance of God's word. It just comes in and it goes out just as fast as it came. No response. Right? The path is not changed because of the seed. And then we have the next kind of soil, the rocky and shallow soil. Now, this soil is very different than the hard path, right? This soil receives the seed. In fact, there is growth that happens, it's, but it's quick growth. Right? They, it, the, the, the plants spring up, they look very healthy right away, but just as fast as they grow, they die on the same speed. Right? They grow quick, but they also die quick because the, the, the soil is shallow, it is rocky, There's, it, it doesn't produce healthy growth. Right? It's, it's quick growth and quick death. That these plants, again, in the application of this, right, of, of those who receive God's word, these are those that turn away at the first sign of struggle. Right? Something doesn't make sense. That, that it is something, you know, they, they think, oh, it's, you know, again, church makes me happy, but as soon as they're not happy, they're gone. Quick growth followed by quick death. And then we have the third kind of soil, and that is the thorny soil, the soil that is full of weeds and thorns. Again, this soil is described in verse 7 and, and then an explanation in verse 22. And we see the result of this soil is strong growth, deep roots, right? Good growth, healthy growth. And yet, within this soil, there is no fruit. There's no harvest. This plant, even though the plant is strong enough to sustain itself, right, it, it, it lacks some, some nutrients, some water, because there are other things in that soil that are also taking that away, right, or robbing it from this plant. And so it, it grows, it's strong enough to survive, but it is not strong enough to produce any harvest. And as Jesus explains to us, right, the weeds and the thorns are the distractions that rule life. And we look at our world today, right? There are all kinds of distractions, right? And, and there, there's kind of, now Jesus calls out, he literally lists two very specific ones in the story, right? He, he, he tells us in the explanation that, that he, he identifies some of these weeds, some of these thorns. It is the worries of life and the lure of wealth. Now, when you think about why did Jesus call these out? Because we know that there are a lot more distractions in this world that will pull us away from our faith than just these two things. So why did Jesus call these two out specifically? Well, I believe part of it is because of who was listening, right? Of this original audience. Think about, we know that the 12 disciples were there, and, and even what we know more about them than we know about the rest of the crowd Right, is that they were from varying backgrounds, but we also see through their stories as we read through the Gospels that these two things were definitely true in their lives. Right, that they had the worries of life. And in fact, you look at a lot of the conversations that Jesus had with the disciples, and you know, we're talking about, well, look what we left behind, Jesus, and we, we've gone all in for you, and we have all these, our families and our jobs and all these things that we left behind. And they're just kind of, again, where are we going to sleep? How are we going to eat? How are we going to pay this tax, right? There's, there's all these conversations that happen within even the disciples within the gospels about the worries of life and all the distractions that they can bring. And yet these also, we know that, right? This lure of wealth. Now, like scripture talks about money and wealth a lot. It's one of the, the top topics in all of scripture, 
Right? And, and, and it's something that we all have to deal with. It's something that, that, that God knows that, which is why he talked about it a lot. But yet we also know it is also something that the disciples struggled with, some more than others. As you know, the most famous one that struggled with money and the lure of wealth is Judas, right? who's, who's famous for all the wrong reasons. Right? And yet we know that that's ultimately, right, that was his downfall, right? That, that he traded Jesus' life for, for money. Right? And yet, it's interesting that obviously Jesus knew that about Judas, and yet Judas was also the treasurer, right? He kept all the money for the disciples, didn't even for Jesus, which, which is a whole different sermon. But as we look at these two things, right, the, the, the worries of life, I mean, the, the lure of wealth, I mean, Jesus calls these out, right, and no, because he knew those were things that even the 12 disciples were struggling with, right, as they were learning the things of, of God and following Jesus, literally following Jesus. And yet, these are both two things that, that we still struggle with today. But yet, we also know that it's not just these things, right? There are so many other things, right, in this world that can distract us, that can pull us away from our faith that can keep us from, from a harvest in our life. The reality, right, is that people do what they're committed to. And we seem to be committed in our culture to everything, usually except God. Right? And, and yet we look at these kinds of soils, we then end, though, in the last kind of soil, and that is the good and fertile soil. Right? This soil is good, right? It's fertile, has all the nutrients. It's, it's, it's not crowded out by weeds and thorns. It's, it's been cultivated well, and, and it's the perfect environment for the seed to, to not just germinate and grow, but, but to be as healthy as it can be to the point where it produces fruit. And, and within the story, we see, as, as it's described in, in verse 8, and then Jesus again plays it out in verse 23, that it's not just some fruit. Right? But it produces a lot of fruit. Right? It starts out with maybe even just the fact it gets to a harvest, but then Jesus kind of shows this, these different levels of harvest. I mean, all the way up to, to miraculous, a hundred times or more. Right? To where there's, there's no other explanation of how much this plant produces other than a miracle from God. And we see these, these kinds of soils and, and the, the, the depending results that come, come with it. But yet notice that even in the good and fertile soil, that even the fact that a, there is a harvest is called good. All, right, all the way up to the miraculous of a hundred or more. So as we look at this parable, we see all these different applications, right? These kinds of soils. Then, then our... First natural question is, what are we supposed to learn? Why did Jesus teach us this? I believe there's, there's several things I think that Jesus wants us to know about our faith right, when we look at this. So as we look at some lessons from this parable, the first one that I think I want to point out is this, is that there is a progression implied in the four soils. Okay, there's a progression implied here. Now, again, the, the natural question, right, the logical question that we all ask even of ourselves, right, is which soil am I? Right, and we can look at the soil and we can see that, and, and yet even as we ask that question, which I think is very appropriate for ask the question, in fact, that's the point of the parable, right, is for us to ask and look at ourselves, which soil am I? Right, but I, I also think it's very important as we ask that question for us to realize that that there is some things that Jesus is not teaching through this parable. Okay, first off, to know that, that, that Jesus is not telling us that you have a 25% chance of being saved. He's not teaching us that. Right? I mean, only 25% of what is presented actually ever produced a harvest. Right? But Jesus is not telling us that you have a 25% chance of being saved. He's not teaching that. Yeah, and, and I can confidently say that because of the progression that's taught here. Right? That, that there's, there's a progression in the soils. Okay, notice that the progressive nature of, of the descriptions of the soils. And, and again, the other thing right, that Jesus is not teaching in this parable is that wherever your heart is now, whichever soil you identify with most now, 
is that you will always be that soil. He's not teaching you that. Right? Because think about the path, right? Even the worn down path is that you can rearrange, right, the, the way that you walk or the path you use, and that path can be tilled up and can be cultivated, and can be made into good fertile soil again. But if, if it's rocky, you can work the soil and remove the rocks, and it will be deeper and till it up deeper. Right? You can weed out the thorns and take those distractions out of your life, and that any soil, no matter what soil you are now, you have the potential of being good and fertile soil. Jesus is not teaching you have a 25% chance of being saved. And he's also not teaching that you have to stay whatever soil you are now. Right? But he is telling us that there is a progressive nature to your faith. That where you are, you do not have to stay. And so when you really think about this question of which soil am I, the true honest answer is probably all of them. Right? And, and if you haven't been all of them, the hope is that you will be, right? That you will progress towards good and fertile. And that there is a journey that, that you will go through, this, prog this progression of growth, right? That naturally happens within your faith and within the soil of your own heart. And again, I don't know where you're at or what soil you are now, but I will tell you, even if you are here in person or watching online and, and you are that person that is that, that firm, hard ground, that, that, that you, maybe you're even wondering, is there, does God even exist? Is there even a God? Okay, I will tell you right now, if, if your heart is hard and firm and we're not even sure if you're even going to accept the seed, I will tell you, is that there's a few things I know for sure, is that there is a God. Okay, and he does love you. And that your heart doesn't have to stay the way it is. Okay, and when we look at this, again, at, at the progression of this, this is exactly what Jesus is trying to teach us, is that you don't have to stay the same. Now, God accepts you exactly the way you are. Okay, you don't have to change to be saved, to receive Jesus as your Savior, to invite him into your life, to join the journey of faith. Right? He accepts you exactly the way you are, even if you are hard, firm, path, soil. Right, but he, he will accept you exactly the way you are, but he will not leave you the same. Okay, and that's what he's teaching us here. And as we look at this, I, I want to show you this verse at Romans 12 too, what I believe is the biblical definition of discipleship, right, of what, what is supposed to happen with our faith. Okay, Romans 12 too says, Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. And then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Now, as we look at that verse, there's a couple of things that it say, right? Is, is first off, is, is this tells us how to grow. It tells us how to move forward in this progression of soil. No matter where you are, it tells us how to grow. And the way you start, you start with not copying the behavior and customs of this world. Right? God's way is different. Okay? And so you start, that's where you start. It says, don't copy the world. Instead, it says, then the next thing, the next key piece, it says, then to let God transform you. Hey, I encourage you to underline that phrase, let God transform you. Because there's some very important things about that phrase. Number one is, who's doing the transforming? God. Let God transform you. Okay, it is not on your shoulders to, to progress or to grow your own faith. It is not on your effort. Okay? And that's the very foundation of the gospel, is that you can't save yourself, right? Even receiving Christ, is you, that's why we need a Savior. That's why we needed Jesus. Right? Is you can't save yourself. And the other side is that you cannot do it good enough to grow yourself. You cannot fix it all in your life. If you do it on your effort, you will fail. You do it with the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. Right? Again, God is the farmer, he will till up your life. He will remove the rocks. He will take the weeds out, right? Let God transform you. And the other part is that you have to actually transform. Right? You have to submit yourself to the farmer. Let the farmer do what the farmer does. And he will change your heart and change your life and you will move forward, right? And he does, that starts with changing the way you think. 
And then you will learn to know God's will for you. And that's a very common question, right? Everybody asks that, especially believers and Christians, right? How do I know what God wants me to do? Well, you have to learn to know. Right? You don't just automatically know. Okay, you have to learn to know God's will and to be able to hear his voice, right? And to be able to be obedient to that. And that, that is a process, okay? Is that you have to uh, submit yourself to the process of change in your life. Now, I know nobody likes change, right? But the only thing that doesn't change in our world is the fact that everything is changing. All right, I'll say that one more time, a little slower. The only thing that doesn't change in our world is the fact that everything is changing. So as much as we don't like change, we need to embrace it. Right? Because the reality is you never stay still in your faith. You never camp in your faith. You have to be journeying forward. And I believe that's one of the biggest lies that we believe in the church is that I've gone far enough with God and I'm fine to just stay right here. And that is a lie. Okay, because the reality is if you are camping in your faith, you are not staying where you are. You're actually moving further away from God because the current of our world and our culture is moving away from God. And if you are sitting in one place, you will be caught up in that current and you will be drifting further and further away from God. And the only way to counteract that drift is to move forward. And you have to move forward on purpose. And you have to let God transform you. Okay, if you are camping in your faith, you are moving further away from God. But move forward. Let God transform you. Right? Everything is always changing. And you know so much when you see that, even with our lives, you don't realize you're changing until you look back and realize how much, how much you've changed. Right? Now again, we know in our valley, we know that our valley is changing. Right? And yet, we, if we, we don't necessarily even realize how much. Now, again, we see the change all the time, right? If you've been trying to drive around our valley at any time, you probably have the same question for me. Is road construction ever done? Right? Like, it, it's always torn up, right? It is. It feels like, right? That's, that never changes, apparently, either, right? It's like we never finish a road project, right? But we see that, right? There's all kinds of changes happening around us. In fact, if we look at our valley, and we look backwards, and we realize how much it has changed, Okay, this is an aerial view of Bronco Stadium in 1985. Okay, the, the interesting thing about this, right, is that, is that what's, what's blue in this picture, the track is blue and the, 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 the football field is green. Okay, now, again, we look at, if we fast forward, right, to a closer time, right, this is still two and a half years ago, Bronco Stadium in 2019. Right now, there is no track, right? Now, the field's blue, right? And you can see how much it's been built up around it, right? The stadium is drastically different. And again, I had to throw this out there because football season's right around the corner. Yes. Right? Hey, but also, we look at that, not just, not just Bron maybe you're not a Boise State football fan, right? But again, think about how much our valley has changed. Okay, this is a picture of Eagle and Fairview in 1992. Okay, in the bottom left corner of that picture is Eagle and Fairview. Okay, this literally today is the busiest intersection in Idaho. Okay, look at it in 1992, 20 years ago. It was farm ground. There was nothing there. Okay, this is Eagle and Fairview in 2019. Right, and it's even more developed now than it is in this picture. Okay, we don't realize how much it's changed until we look back at where we were. Right, and I say the same is exactly true in your faith. Right? If you just continue to go every day and say, I'm growing, I'm going to be more like Christ tomorrow than I am today. I'm going to do these spiritual disciplines. I'm going to learn. I'm going to let God transform me. I'm going to submit to his will. Right? I'm going to follow his voice. I'm going to do all these things. Right? And just, I just day after day, I just, I just forward in my faith and I keep my focus on Jesus and on the destination of my journey and I just keep going. And then all of a sudden I'm going to look up and be like, wow, I'm different. Right? And I'm moving closer to Christ. Right? And that's exactly what should be the goal of our faith. Everything changes over time, including your faith. And the truth is you're never staying the same. Right? You're either moving forward or you're drifting further away. Right? And we make that choice. Am I going to engage in my faith journey and grow, or am I going to drift with the world and get further and further away? The first thing is we see this progressive nature 
of this parable, the, the next thing that we learn is that the fruit looks different depending on how far down the journey you are. The fruit will look different depending on how far down the journey you are. I'll tell you, again, my faith journey is different than your faith journey. And where I'm at in my life is different than where you're at in your life and your faith. And so the fruit of my life will look different than the fruit of your life. Okay, that depending on where you are in the journey, that fruit will be different. Now, we see throughout Scripture, there's some different places where, the, where the, the results of our faith, this harvest, this fruit, is described. Okay, first off, is we see in Galatians, is we see the fruits of the Spirit. Okay, now again, it's not a coincidence that it's the same parable that's used in all of these things, right? Fruits of the Spirit, right? And these are character traits that will be true as God transforms your heart. They'll be more true in your life. Right, then we see, again, the fruits of good deeds right, that come out in your life as you progress in your faith. The more you learn about who you are and how God made you and who God is, the more good deeds that you will do. Now, again, this is not you working for your salvation. Right? Is your, your salvation is completely free. You cannot earn it. Right? You don't have to earn it. It is by grace. Right? But yet, the result of your faith will be good works. Right? But you will do good works because of your faith journey and you moving forward in it and God transforming your heart, not to earn God's love. You don't have to earn God's love. You already have it. Right? And we see that those, the good deeds right, is a fruit and, and a part of, of the harvest of your life. And then also, again, the, the, kind of the, the end of the road, right? the, the goal of our faith as a disciple of Jesus, right? the ultimate fruit is to produce other disciples. To help other people grow in their faith. But in fact, we see this in, in the Great Commission. We looked at the biblical definition of discipleship. This is the biblical definition of evangelism, of spreading the gospel message. And this, is, this passage is known as the Great Commission. Right? It was Jesus' parting words with the apostles right before he ascended to heaven after his resurrection. Okay, he said, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And we see this, right? Jesus was passing the baton from, from his work as the Messiah to the church, and that we are now carrying that baton, right, that Jesus gave us. And he, this is our mission, is to spread the gospel around the world. Right? But yet, even within the, the Great Commission, right, is that we still see a progression that happens if God's word is spread and growing. Even with each of us, in the Great Commission, Jesus describes four different demographics of people. Do you see the first demographic he describes is the nations, right? The world, the unbelieving world. Those that don't know him. And if we are doing our job as, as Jesus' followers, right, of doing what Jesus tells us to do as the church, right, that we will go into the world and we will share the gospel and that the, the the nations will then become new disciples when they receive Jesus as their Savior. Right? And that's the second demographic of people, right? We have nations, and then he says, then these new disciples. And then these new disciples will continue to grow in their faith and move forward in their journey, be, become more like Christ tomorrow than they are today, and they will mature from being a new disciple to a disciple. Right? It's no longer new anymore, right? They've progressed. Right? They know, so the, the fourth demographic is that we are able to teach the teachers. Now again, if, if, once we progress in our faith to the fact that we, have, we know something that the nations don't know, and then, then we can teach it to them. And you know, where do we find that? Well, this, there's this natural progression and cycle that Jesus is describing here. Right? That we should be progressing in our faith and moving through these, these phases of our faith as we see these four demographics of people. Again, as, as maybe you don't know, but if you don't, now you do know, the vision of our church is join the journey, right? And that's our vision and that's our mission. As we see that, right, we want to progress in the journey of faith as a community of followers of Jesus, right? As we do that, we, we've identified some, just some common phases of the spiritual journey, just like Jesus identifies them in the Great Commission, right? And, and so, as you see within our our vision of our church is that we have these kind of these five phases of growth, right? That we start out attending. We're just hearing the things of God. Like I said, whether you, you are already a believer or, or don't even believe that there is a God, that you start to hear the, the truths about who God is. 
and the gospel message and to be saved. And, and we hope that through attending or hearing, whether you're listening online or coming with a friend or in person or you just wandered yourself in, that you'll find God here through attending. And you'll receive Jesus as your Savior and you will join the journey of faith. And as we start, then once we start attending and we start to learn about God, then we will grow. We'll move to this next phase in our faith of growing. Right? And we grow through deeper teachings and deeper relationships. Our primary strategy for you to grow is small groups. You know, you will learn and grow on Sunday, and I hope that you will, but, but again, the next level of your growth will happen through small groups or classes or deeper level teaching, deeper level relationships than you get here on a Sunday morning. And again, whether that's a Wednesday night or, or uh, one of the other weeks or, or, you know, whatever that, but grow deeper. And as you grow, then, then as you, you grow in your faith, right, then you'll start to produce a harvest in your life. And one of the ways you harvest is through serving. Right, and you volunteer. And again, you can volunteer in our church. There's lots of roles you can volunteer for here, but not just in our church, but you will just get and serve in a ministry. And anything that you do that brings God glory can be a ministry. And that's not just in the walls of the church. In fact, most of your ministry won't be in the walls of the church. Right? You will um, serve God and in a ministry right, just through growing your own faith right? and being outside in the world and doing your life, whether as you can, again, a ministry of me being the best spouse I can be, the best parent I can be, the best family member, the best coworker, the best neighbor, the best coach, right? Whatever it is, right? is all of those things are ways you can serve God right? as you live out your faith. And, and as it continues to grow, you start to see that. Now, as you continue to grow, then you'll move from serving and just volunteering and, and roles to where taking up a higher level of responsibility. When you hear God's voice and he directs your paths, to where you stand up and to lead where God needs you to lead. Right, and take it to, to a whole nother level, right, than just volunteering or serving, right, but taking deeper level of responsibility. Right, and speak up where God needs you to speak up and lead, you know, where he needs you to lead. And, and then we say from there, then again, leading to the Great Commission, that you become a disciple who helps grow other disciples to where you can mentor someone. Again, where are you going to find that person to mentor? Right, well, probably back either the nations that aren't even attending and encouraging somebody else to attend, right? The wheel represents the journey, and then again, it's round. It keeps going. Right, and this should be an ongoing cycle within our life and our faith journey and our faith growth. Right, we see, again, the overall cycle that comes. We start out consuming and learning the things of God, and then we move towards contributing to his kingdom. And the more that we contribute, the more that we know we need to continue to learn and grow and consume the things of God. And it starts this ongoing, repeating cycle in our lives as we move from consuming to contributing and to where we are continuing to learn and to grow. And as we look at these, these phases and these, these you know, phases of growth and, and journey is that, that we want to help you as much as you can to grow in your faith and move forward in your journey. And so we have these journey classes, these spiritual growth classes that we believe help you move forward in your faith and in your growth. And we offer these journey classes, and again, the next opportunity for journey class one is where you start, and our goal is to have everyone who calls Oregon Trail their home church to go through these classes. Again, they're not required. You don't have to. Nobody's making you do it, right? But we believe that they will help you if you do. And, and again, you don't have to go through the classes to serve. You don't have to go through the classes to, 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 to lead and those things, but again, we highly encourage you to do it because we believe it'll help you. Right, the classes are designed to be the bridge to the next phase of your growth. Journey class one is where you start with that. And in fact, the next opportunity to take journey class one happens to be next Sunday. So if, you, if you're ready to do that, you can sign up for it. If you don't sign up, still come. Right, we're ready to be after church next Sunday. In fact, we are committed to offer journey class one once a month. So if you're not ready to take it next Sunday, just take it the next month. Hey, you can start that class. And hey, we're going to offer them on, on Wednesday nights, some this year, as well as on, on Sundays after, after church. So I hey, encourage you. That now, once you've done one, you get that, the basics of our church, so you move on to journey class two. And, and again, each one will help you to move on to the next phase of your growth and the next phase of your faith. So we, we learned, again, these, these important truths about from this parable. The next one that I want to... to that we need to learn, right, lessons from this parable, is that the farmer is present no matter the condition of the soil. Okay, again, you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be good, fertile soil for God to, to care about you. 
He cares about you no matter what soil you are. Right? He is present no matter the condition of the soil. Jesus is with you on your journey. No matter what, no matter where you're at, no matter if you're just, even, like I said, even if you deny his existence, he still loves you and is still with you. But right? we see that truth communicated at the, the last line of the Great Commission, the second part of verse 20. In fact, we, I, we didn't read it before, right? The end of the Great Commission says, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Those are the words of Jesus. And that is a promise from God that we claim every day. God's with me. Nothing will change that. Right? The, the farmer is present no matter the condition of the soil. And the, 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 the next lesson that we need to know and take to heart is that the same seed is thrown on all four kinds of soil. Right? The gospel message is still the gospel message. And no matter how much the world changes around us, God's word is always God's word. Right? And it is our foundation. Right? It, is, it is our roadmap. And that, again, it is our core value that we stand on God's word. Right? And that the same seed, God's word, is on all four kinds of soil. No matter what soil it is, no matter how it's changing, no matter how hard it gets, the gospel does not change. Right? We see in 2 Timothy 4, 3-5. It says, For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. But you should keep a clear mind in every situation. Don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. Work at telling others the good news and fully carry out the ministry God has given you. Now, this, this concept was true when Paul wrote it thousands of years ago, and it is absolutely just as true today. And, and that, again, we will not change what Scripture says or change the gospel message based on what is happening around us. Right? That we will keep a clear mind, and we will follow God, and the good news is still the good news of the gospel. The destination of our journey is Christ. It is not our own desires. Right? It's not about finding something just saying what we want to hear. Again, God is the one that does the saving. He's the one that does the transforming. Right? And he's the one that makes the rules. And so what is our role? If that's all God's role, right? then, then what's my role? Well, our job as Jesus followers is to tend the soil of our hearts. Not to create a harvest. Right? My job and your job as a follower of Jesus is not to create a harvest. Right? My job is to tend the soil of my own heart. Right? To make sure that my heart is good and fertile, that God's word is growing, that I'm moving forward in my faith, right? that, that I'm showing the world who he really is, not what they want to see necessarily, or, or, or even what it looks like to camp in my faith. I, I'm living out my faith every day. Remember that God is the one that saves, and God is the one that causes growth. And again, I believe that's one of the, the most misconceptions about evangelism, right, is we feel like that it's on our shoulders to save people, and that is absolutely not true. Because the reality is I can't save anybody, and neither can you. Right? Only God can save. Right? My job as a follower of Jesus is just to show the world what following Jesus really looks like. Right? We talked about that last week, right, about the persecuted, that is your life as a follower of Jesus different enough that people will notice and maybe ask about it, and then you tell them why it's different. It's because of God. All right, our job as Jesus followers is to tend the soil of my own heart. We see in 1 Corinthians 3, 6 through 7. It says, I planted the seed in your hearts, and Apollos watered it, but God was who made it grow. It's not important who does the planting or who does the watering. What's important is that God makes the seed grow, and God will make the seed grow in your life as well as in others. So as we look at this parable, this concept, this overarching theme, right, of the fact that I need to grow in my faith, that I need to move forward in my journey every day. As we come to our final thought, I say, I can't say it any better than Scripture already says it. And so my final thought today comes out of Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And it says, Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, 
especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. And we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Again, God is at work. God is tending your life and, and, and throwing out his truths. And the question is, how will we respond? Right, will we follow what God's told us to do? Right, will we move forward in our faith and say, I'm, I'm committed to growing in my faith. I'm not going to camp. And I don't know where your faith is at today. And again, your journey is going to look different than mine. If you're here today or watching online and you've never received Jesus as your Savior, you've never joined the journey of faith, I hope you will do that now, today. If, if you have received Jesus, are you moving forward in your faith? Take the next step, right? To being baptized, going to a journey class, going into a small group, whatever it looks like, take a step forward. I hope you'll take a step forward this morning. God, this morning we come to you, Lord, thankful that we can be broken and yet you cultivate our hearts and our lives, God, so that we can grow. And Lord, we thank you for, Lord, saving us no matter where we are. Lord, we thank you for taking us exactly the way we are. But Lord, we also thank you for not leaving us there. God, for changing us, for transforming our hearts and our minds. And God, as we go this week, I pray, God, that you would guide us through the next step of our faith. God, that we will grow. We will move forward closer to you. And God, that through us living our faith, Lord, that we will show this world who you really are and what following you really means. God, and we claim that promise that you are with us no matter what we face. And we thank you for that today. And we ask, God, that as we move forward in our faith, that you would take us and transform us and open the path. Lord, help us see what you need us to see. Lord, as we go this week, we will live our faith and be your church as we shine your life in this dark world. Guide us as we go, in Jesus' name, amen.